Hi, this is our recorded lesson for today. I'm going to walk you through the Nearpod activity that you should be doing while you watch this video. It's embedded in the class announcements and the link is below the embedded lesson if the embed isn't working for you. They also emailed you the link. So if you got to this video, you probably won't have a hard time finding the Nearpod in there. Make sure you complete the Nearpod uh, with full and accurate responses for credit for attending class today. So today we're going to focus on um, analyzing how a central idea emerges from details in narrative nonfiction. So we're looking for details to help us identify central ideas. This is a little tricky, but I give you the options here. I want you to pause the recording and in the Nearpod, do your best to fill in the blanks here. So where do each of these words fit? We've got the blank blank is the main message of a blank or blank text. The blank is the main message of a blank text. So two sentences here and some words down here at the bottom. We've got nonfiction, idea, informational, central, fictional, and theme. Pause and give it your best shot. All right, hopefully that was enough time for you. I'm gonna give it my best shot. First one's a little trickier. Let's see how I did. Woohoo! I got it right. Hopefully you did too. Okay, today we're going to be diving into a non-fictional story. The author of this story is called William Least Heat Moon. He comes from English Irish Osage ancestry. Um, his birth name is William Trogdon, and he publishes under the last name Heat Moon, the Native American name of his father. And he's a writer of several travel and history books, which, as you can imagine, are nonfiction. Um, I'm curious to know, I want you to use your draw tool to show me how many states you have visited. So if you've been to that state, I want you to draw on it. Use whatever color you want. I'm going to go with white because we got a colorful map here. Obviously, I'm to Utah. I live here. I've been to Nevada, California, Idaho, Montana. This is seeming not very <laughs> exciting. Colorado, I'm to New Mexico, but not since I was a kid. And that's as far west or as far east as I've gone in a vehicle has wheels. Well, I guess I should say a car. <laughs> because planes have wheels too. But I've also been to New York and New Jersey. I've been to Circle Maine. I'm not sure if I've been to Connecticut. I know I've been to Rhode Island. I've flown into that airport. I've stayed there. I've been to Massachusetts several times. DC. I'm not good at circling. <laughs> I think that's it. Mostly west and then the east coast gotta get into the midwest and the south one of these days oh i've been to hawaii too all the way down here you might be thinking uh okay miss Bellamy, why do you care i promise it relates to our story today <laughs> we're reading a story called nameless tennessee if we switch back a page to see where tennessee is on our map i have not been there have i it's right here, Tennessee, so it's towards the east side of the Midwest. Um, and this is from that author we mentioned, William Lee's Heat Moon, and this is an excerpt from a larger piece that he wrote called Blue Highways. So I want you to pay attention to the vocabulary words that you don't know or you may not know. Um, if you've got the digital copy or the physical copy of the book, it should be on page 173 in our anthology or the textbook. Uh, and you can obviously see it on the screen here as well. I'm going to read it out loud. If you want to listen or if you want to pause and read it to yourself, that's fine too. I do recommend reading it out loud to yourself just because it helps it stick in your brain a little better and helps you slow down and notice more details. All right, here we go. Nameless Tennessee. From Blue Highways by William Least Heatman. 
Nameless Tennessee was a town of maybe 90 people, if you pushed it. A dozen houses along the road, a couple of barns, same number of churches, a general merchandise store selling fire chief gasoline, and a community center with a lighted volleyball court. Behind the center was an open roof, rusting metal privy with paint me on the door. From the houses, the odor of coal smoke. Next to a red tobacco barn, next to a red tobacco barn stood the general merchandise with a poster of Senator Albert Gore Jr. smiling from the window. I knocked. The door opened partway. A tall, thin man said, closed up for good, and started to shut the door. Don't want to buy anything. Just a question for Mr. Thurmond Watts. The man peered through the slight opening. He looked over me. What question would that be? If this is name was Tennessee, could he tell me how it got that name? The man turned back into the store and called out, Miss Ginny, somebody here wants to know the nameless, how nameless come to be nameless. Miss Ginny edged to the door and looked me and my truck over. Clearly, she didn't approve. She said, you know as well as I do, Thurman. Don't keep him on the stoop in the damp to tell him. Miss Ginny, I found out, was Mrs. Virginia Watts, Thurman's wife. I stepped in, and they both began telling the story, adding a detail here, the other correcting a fact there, both smiling at the foolishness of it all. It seems the hilltop settlement went for years without a name. Then one day, the post office department... What did the post office department do? We'll find out on the next page. The narrator, or the author, is clearly visiting this town called Nameless, Tennessee. Why do you think he's here? He hasn't necessarily explicitly told the reader, but has come up in the dialogue. So I want you to take a second and highlight sentences that tell the reader why our narrator is in Nameless, Tennessee. You probably figured it out by now, but as he tells the man who opened the door, which we find out is the man he's looking for, Thurmond Watts, he is there to figure out why Nameless Tennessee is called Nameless Tennessee. Okay, I'm going to pick up from that sentence that I didn't quite finish. Um, then one day, the post office department told the people if they wanted mail up on the mountain, they would have to give the place a name that you could properly address a letter to. The community met. There were only a handful, but they commenced debating. Some wanted patriotic names, some names from, from nature. One man recommended, in all seriousness, his own name. They couldn't agree, and they ran out of names to argue about. Finally, a fellow, tired of the talk, he didn't like the mail he received anyway, Forget the darn post office, he said. This here's a nameless place if I ever seen one, so leave it be. And that's just what they did. Watts pointed out the window. We used to have signs on the road, but the Halloween boys kept keep tearing them down. You think nameless is a funny name, Miss Jenny said. I see it, it plain in your eyes. Well, you take yourself up north to a, a piece to difficult or defeated or shake rag. Now them are silly names. The old store, lighted only by three 50-watt bulbs, smelled of coal oil and baking bread. In the middle of the rectangular room, where the oak floor, where the oak floor sagged a little, stood an iron stove. To the right was a wooden table with an unfinished game of checkers and a stool made from an apple tree stump. On shelves around the walls sat earthen jugs with corn cob stoppers, a few canned goods, and some of the of the two thousand old clocks and clockworks Thurmond Watts owned. Only one was ticking. The others he just looked at. I asked how long he'd been in the store. Thirty-five years, but we closed those. We closed the first day of the year. We're hoping to sell it to a churchly couple. Upright people. No atheans. Did you, did you build this store? I built this one, but it's the third general store on the ground. I fear it'll be the last. I take no pleasure in that. Once you could come in here for a gallon of paint, a pickle, a 
pair of shoes, and a can of corn. Poor Horham candy, Miss Jenny said. More corsets and salves. We had a, a cough syrup and all that for the body. In season, we'd buy and sell blackberries and walnuts and chestnuts. Okay, let's pause for a second. How did the town, oh, let's go back here, get its name? Try to do your best to summarize it in one sentence. What was the reason that they ended up naming the town Mainless Tennessee? You may remember town members really couldn't agree. They couldn't agree on a name, so they left it nameless. Which kind of makes me wonder, if you could name a town, what would you name it? Would you be like the guy who suggested his own name? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, we have two correct answers here, so let's check yours and see how you did. One, the post office said they wouldn't deliver mail if the, uh, they didn't name the town. Two, no one could agree on a name, so they left it nameless. Three, the post office named it. Four, the townspeople voted on it. Which of these two are correct? Okay. There wasn't really a way to answer that on that slide as far as the near pod goes, but if you check to your answer against it, then you'll know if it was correct or not. It was the first two. So now we're going to practice making an inference. Remember, we learned yesterday an inference um, is using your prior knowledge and then clues in the text to make an assumption, essentially. Uh, so you're going to be a detective. Back to our Mysteries, Inc. roots here. Um, look for some clues. Pretend you're in Nameless, Tennessee. You're visiting the general merchandise or the general store. The store is closed or has gone out of business. Why have is the store closed? What do you think? What are the clues that led you to this conclusion? So pause the recording, take a couple minutes, and think about your paragraph. And once you've thought about why, you can go back to the story if you need to, to take a look at the text. In fact, I recommend you do. Once you find some evidence from the text, go ahead and start writing your explanation. And be sure to mention that information from the text in your paragraph. I'm going to write mine while I'm thinking about it. Okay, that's my paragraph. Hopefully you had some thoughts off of your own. Okay, well let's keep reading. Okay, 
right, so this sentence started out in season. We buy blackberries, chestnuts, and walnuts before the blight got them. And outside, Thurman milled corn and sharpened plows. He even shoot a horse sometimes. We could fix a horse up, or a man, or a baby, so Wad said. Thurman, tell him we had a doctor on the ridge in them days. We had a doctor on the ridge in them days. As good as any doctor alive. And he cut a crooked toenail and deliver a woman dead these last years. I got some bad hand meat one day, Miss Jenny said, and took to vomiting. All day, all night, hanging on the drop edge of yonder. I said to Thurman, Thurman, unless you want to show to me, call the doctor. I studied on it, Watts said. You never did. You got him right now. He come over and put three drops of iodine and half a glass of well water. I drank it down and the vomiting stopped with the, the last swallow. Would you think iodine could do that? He put Miss Jenny on one teaspoon of spirits of ammonia in well water for her nerves. Ain't nothing works better for her to this day. Calms me like the hand of the Lord. Hilda, the Watts's daughter, came out of the back room. I remember him, she said. I was just a baby. Y'all were talking to him, and he lifted me up on the counter and gave me a stick of juicy fruit and a piece of cheese. Knew the old medicines, Watts said. Only drugstore he needed was a good kitchen cabinet. None of them antibiotics that hit you worse than your ailment. Forgotten lore now, the old medicine, because they ain't profiting on iodine. Miss Jenny started back to the side of the room where she and her sister Marilyn were taking apart a duck-down mattress to make bolsters. She stopped at the window for another look at ghost dancing. How do you sleep in that thing? Ain't you all cramped and cold? We'll come back to that funky sentence about ghost dancing in a minute here. I want you to think about the exchange between Thurmond and his wife, Miss Jenny. She says, I got some bad meat one day, Miss Jenny said, and took to vomit in all day, all night, hanging on the drop of edge, the, the drop edge of yonder. I said to Thurmond, Thurmond, unless you want shut of me, call the doctor. I studied on it, Watt said. You never did. You got him right now. <laughs> So this is kind of a quirky exchange, and how I read it, I suppose, might influence your answer. So read it how you'd like. Um, but why is it funny that he said, I studied on it? Maybe it's not. Maybe you don't think it's funny. Um, but what's going on between them? Let's, you can ask yourself, you know, what's the tone? Why would he say that? What do you think he means? Any of those questions will help you get writing. While you write yours, I'm going to write mine. you've got yours written, submit it. Okay, well, let's keep going. How does the clam sleep in his shell? So she just asked him how do you sleep in that thing, referring to his vehicle, and Watts was defending him. How does the clam sleep in his shell? Thurman, get the boy a piece of buttermilk pie after, before he goes on. Yoda, get him some buttermilk pie. He looked at me. You like good music? I said I did. He cranked up an old Edison phonograph, the kind with the big morning glory blossom for a speaker, and put on a wax cylinder. This'll be my mother's prayer, he said. 
while I ate buttermilk pie, Watts served a disc jockey of nameless, or served as disc jocks. <laughs> Watts served as disc jockey of nameless Tennessee. Here's Mountain Rose. It was one of those moments that you know at the time will stay with you to the grave. The sweet pie, the gaunt man playing the old music, the coals in the stove glowing orange, the scent of kerosene and hot bread. Here's Union Rhapsody. The music was so heavily romantic, we both laughed. I thought, it is for this I have come. Feathered over and giggling, Miss Jenny stepped from the side room. She knew she was a sight. Thurman, give him some lunch. Still looks hungry. Hilda pulled food off the wood stove in the back room. Home butchered and canned whole hog sausage, home canned June apples, turnip greens, coleslaw, potatoes, stuffing, hot cornbread, all delicious. Watts and Hilda sat and talked while I ate. Wish you would, co wish you would join me. We've ate, Watts said. Can't beat the wood stove for flavorful cooking. He told me he was raised in a 150-year-old cabin, still standing in one of the hollows. How many's left? He said, they grew up in a log cabin. I ain't the last, surely, but I must be climbing on the, on the list. Hilda cleared the table. You Watts ladies know how to cook. She's in nursing school at Tennessee Tech. I went over for one of them football games last year at Coolville. To say Cookville, you let the word collapse upon itself so that it comes out Coolville. All right, let's pause again and see how well we understood this. This is a big deal, this paragraph. So go back and reread it to yourself. I'll reread it to you as well. While I ate buttermilk pie, Watts served as disc jockey of Nameless Tennessee. Here's Mountain Rose. It was one of those moments that you know at the time will stay with you to the grave. The sweet pie, the gaunt man playing the old music, the coals in the stove glowing orange, the scent of kerosene and hot bread. Here's Evening Rhapsody. The music was so heavily romantic, we both laughed. I thought, it is for this I have come. So, notice that the narrator says, it is for this I have come. What does he mean? Earlier, he had said that he had come to learn how Nameless got his name, and now he's saying that he came to Tennessee for this. What do you think this is? Remember, use the paragraph we just read as your context clues, your textual evidence. If you need to pause the recording to write the response, go for it. I'm going to write mine.
Okay, that's my paragraph. And maybe you came up with something totally different, and that is just fine. And you may wonder why I'm not reading my paragraphs to you. You can certainly read them to yourself, um, but I don't want to influence your response uh, being an original response from you. So if you need an idea, certainly take a look at the paragraphs that I'm writing, but I'd love for your response to be authentically from your brain. All right, let's continue. Do you like football? I asked. Don't know. I was so high up in that stadium, I never opened my eyes. Watts went to the back and returned with a fat spiral notebook that he set on the table. His expression had changed. Miss Jenny's dead book. The thing startled me. Was it something I was supposed to sign? He opened it, but said nothing. There were scads of names written in a tidy hand over pages incised to crinkliness by a ballpoint. Chronologically, the names had piled up. Wives, grandparents, stillborn if infant, relatives, friends, close and distant, names, names. After each, the date of the unknown, finally known and transcribed. The last entry bore yesterday's date. She wrote out 20 years worth. Every day she listens to the hospital report on the radio and puts names in. Folks come by to check a date or they just turn through the books, read them like a scrapbook. Hilda said, like St. Peter at the gate, scrapping the names. Watts took my arm. Come along. He led me to the fruit cellar under the store. As we went down, he said, Always take a newborn baby upstairs before you take him downstairs. Otherwise, you'll incline him downwards. <laughs> the cellar was dry and full of cobwebs, and jar after jar of home canned food, the bottled the bottles organized as a shopkeeper would. Sausage, pumpkin, sweet pickles, tomatoes, corn relish, blackberries, pepper squash, jellies. He held the hand out toward the dusty bottles. Our tomorrows. Upstairs again, he said. Hope to sell the store to the right folk. I see now, though. It'll be somebody off on the ridge. I've studied on it. And maybe it's the, the end of our place. He stirred the coals. This store could give a comfortable living, but not likely to get you rich. Just getting by is dice rolling to people nowadays. I never did see my day guaranteed. When it was time to go, Watts said, If you find anyone along your way wants a good store on the road to Cordell Hull Lake, tell them about us. I said I would. Miss Jenny and Hilda and Marilyn came out to say goodbye. It was cold and drizzling drizzling again. Okay, well, let's talk about this before we move on. The death book. <laughs> Miss Jenny keeps a death book. What is your reaction to this? Not a right or wrong answer. Just kind of want to know what you think. response and this one I will read to you because I think it's um, an interesting one. The first time I read this story um, and noticed the death book I thought that was kind of creepy and like the author says is this something I'm supposed to sign? Um, 
but then I realized as, you know, the, as Watts keeps talking and as the narrator listens, that really it's kind of a service to the town, uh, that she's keeping a record of their loved ones. Um, they probably don't have any kind of organized, uh, town government. So it may have been one of the only formal records the town had of the inhabitants. Uh, so it's actually kind of touching and very important to the town. And I went over by a couple words. Whoops. <laughs> Learn to write concisely. <laughs> All right. Let's continue. Whether to give the man a... The weary dismals, Watts grumbled. Where are you headed from here? I don't know. Can't get lost then, Miss Jenny looked again at my rig. It had worried her from the first, as it had my mother. I hope you don't get yourself killed in that darn thing, gallivanting around the country. Come back when the hills dry off, Watts said. We'll go looking for some of them round rocks, all sparkly inside. I thought a moment. Geodes? Them's the ones. Country's properly full of them. Okay, so you may not have picked up on Miss Jenny's asking about his vehicle. And she mentioned a couple pages ago something about ghost dancing in reference to how he sleeps like that. And Watts defended him saying, you know, oyster sleep in shells. <laughs> so it's this idea that his car is his shell and he sleeps in it. He's not sleeping in the back of his car. I kind of get the idea here that he's driving like a van that he can sleep in. Because, I mean, if he's going to visit a town named Nameless Tennessee, where is he going to stay when he gets there, right? <laughs> These folks have been nice to him and entertained him and were, it seemed, happy to have company who wanted to hear about their town. Uh, but they're not a bed and breakfast or some kind of place to host company from out of town, right? So... I want you to think for a minute, why did Watts ask him back? Um, and how would you characterize or describe the Watts family? Look for textual evidence to support your thoughts on this. So we do have four members in the household, but I want you to focus specifically on Thurmond, his wife, Miss Jenny. Our two main characters. We hear from Hilda a bit, but we don't really hear a whole lot from Marilyn, Miss Jenny's sister. So focus on Thurmond and his wife. How would you describe them? If you need to pause the recording here, go ahead and pause the recording to type. All right. And this is what I wrote here. And this is one response that you ought to keep brief like I <laughs> failed to do in the first brief one. Sometimes we'll write a little bit longer, but on ones like this, I just want you to write what comes to mind first and try to keep it brief. All right. And that's it. There's not a link to the exit ticket because this is the exit ticket for the day. If you've completed the Nearpod with real accurate answers. You get credit for class today. So thanks for watching the recording. Thanks for doing the Nearpod. I hope that helps you understand Nameless Tennessee. Next time we have a live class session, we will analyze it. Have a great day.